Okay, everyone, shut up and look at me. Welcome to Visions of Nature. This room has several paintings in it. Some are big, some are small. People did them and they are here now. I believe that after this is over, they'll be hung in government buildings. Why the government is involved in an art show is beyond me. I also think it's pointless for a human to paint scenes of nature when they could just go outside and stand in it. Anyway, please do not misinterpret the fact that I am talking right now as genuine interest in art and attempt to discuss it with me further. End of speech. Nick Offerman might be best known as the super libertarian Ron Swanson from NBC's hit comedy Parks and Recreation. Apart from being an actor, he's also a woodworker and has also written a few books. Nick Offerman decided to take Ron's advice and he did go outside and stand in nature. After the break, we'll talk to Nick about his new book, Where the Deer and the Antelope Play, the pastoral observations of one ignorant American who loves to walk outside. You're listening to the 1A Podcast. I'm Jen White. We'll be back with more in just a moment. And remember to join future conversations, download our 1A Vox Pop app, and leave us a voicemail. Support for NPR and the following message come from Nationwide Pet Insurance. This holiday season, cover your pet with more than just ugly sweaters. When you cover your pet with a Nationwide Pet Insurance plan, you can use any veterinarian anywhere and get reimbursed for accidents, illnesses, and wellness care. Coverage is available for dogs, cats, birds, and exotic pets, including rabbits, lizards, and more. Give your pet the gift of good health. Visit PetInsurance.com to find a plan today. This message comes from NPR sponsor, WiseAnt. Need a smarter way to learn anything? WiseAnt is the nation's biggest network of professional tutors, connecting you with experts in more than 12,000 topics for personalized one-on-one lessons. On WiseAnt, you choose how much to pay, who you work with, and when you meet, in person or online. NPR listeners can experience the difference personalized tutoring makes this back-to-school season by taking $25 off each of your first three lessons. Head to wyzant.com slash NPR today to start learning. On this season of the StoryCorps podcast from NPR, stories about people who defied the odds. I was a a colored boy from South Carolina going to become an astronaut, but Ron was the one who didn't accept societal norms as being his norm. Our new season drops December 7th. Listen on the NPR One app at npr.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Over this last year and a half, the world's been through a lot. So on this season of the StoryCorps podcast, we'll hear stories reminding us that even when times are hard, we can still begin again. Listen to our new season wherever you get your podcasts. Let's jump into the conversation with Nick Offerman, who's joining us from L.A. Nick, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, the new book, as I said, is called Where the Deer and the Antelope Play, The Pastoral Observations of One Ignorant American Who Loves to Walk Outside. Why an ignorant American? Well, that's the jumping off point. You know, uh, so many uh, of our of our national conversations uh, have a strange pride or, or denial to them when you hear a politician say, I don't have a racist bone in my body or sort of denying the impact that that systemic uh, racism or homophobia or xenophobia has on any of our of our social constructs instead stepping back and saying well of course we're all ignorant we're human we'll never know all the information all we can do is our best to treat one another equitably while we try and create social programs that are fair to everybody. We can never get it right. We'll never get 100% on that test. But as long as we can recognize our ignorance and say, okay, what are we screwing up right now and how can we try and make it better, then we stand a chance to eventually, hopefully, be at least fair to everyone in the way that our Constitution lays out. There was a question you set out to explore with this book. It was a challenge to see conservation through the lens of Aldo Leopold rather than John Muir, both famous white conservationists active in the late 18th and early early 19th centuries. For those unfamiliar, who were both of these men? Well, John Muir uh, is sort of the father of our national parks. He was uh, an incredible uh, naturalist, and he took Teddy Roosevelt camping uh, at what became Yosemite. And so he, he is more responsible than anybody for the creation of what they called our nation's crown jewels. Um, 
And so that sensibility is when you think of nature and conservation, it's the big picture version of like, oh, sure, Yosemite, you know, gl Glacier, Yellowstone, that's nature. That's what we need to save for the future. And Aldo Leopold is, is a much more sort of localized Madison, Wisconsin based agrarian who uh, was a little bit later than John Muir, but a, a similarly historic um, sort of naturalist where he, he was interested in the nature of your backyard and your garden and your field uh, and your and your watershed, your ecosystem. So instead of looking through the lens of John Muir and thinking about Yosemite, Aldo Leopold urges, urges all of us to look in our own yards and in our own neighborhoods and say, how are we participating as as cogs and wheels in in this natural mechanism um, so that we have an idea of how we are participating or not in the health of nature where we live? What did you learn by trying to view nature and national parks through Leopold's lens? Well, just that uh, just that it, you don't have to travel very far uh, to have an incredible experience. Um, I think it's very American, the, uh, or the sort of Disneyfication uh, of national parks that like to, to go visit nature is something that requires travel and money and expense and lodging. And, and through the lens of Aldo Leopold, you can, you can create an incredible journey on your windowsill with the, the, uh, infinite myriad of, of things that you can grow in a, in a teacup, or you can find whatever place is near to you that you can walk to that requires no fossil fuels, um, and can occupy entire days without costing one, without costing you a cent. I, I would love for you to explain a bit more about what it means to live as an agrarian. Well, the first and foremost thing, uh, Wendell Berry, uh, the great agrarian author from Kentucky, says that eating is an agricultural act. So it's this idea, and that was sort of the jumping off point for me when I started reading the agrarian writers, was understanding, oh, if I'm interested in food, which I believe we all are, uh, then we need to understand where our food is coming from, who is who's creating it, who's providing it for us. And how uh, how good of a job are they doing with our agency in creating sustainable uh, food sources? You know th that are regenerative, um, and of course, the vast majority of civilization has has grown so uh, cushy that we no longer have to to wonder who grew these tomatoes and where and how are they treating the ecosystem? Where did this bacon come from? Is this good bacon, or is it is it from a factory farming situation? Um, and so, so digging into that, uh, that's how I, as a citizen of Los Angeles, California, can become a member of the agrarian community and say, okay, where what farmers markets am I going to visit today to get my sweet corn to make my famous dish, corn my way for Thanksgiving dinner, and knowing where the food is coming from in my neighborhood. Uh, and immediately, once you, once you begin to discern that, you will be amazed how much healthier and cleaner the food sources can be. It's more expensive, which is why I'm very vocal about it, is, is we, need to, uh, we need to get our food systems back to the place where everybody can afford to have pasture-raised eggs instead of that being somehow a premium item. Did, did you just slide in a, a recipe reference there, Nick? I, oh, I did. Oh, uh, I, that was uh, purely accidental, but <laughs> that recipe does exist in my third book, Good Clean Fun. Uh, that's, my, that's my one the one dish people ask me to bring is, uh, is my sweet corn dish called Corn My Way. What's in it? I have to ask. Corn, corn. It's it's. it's there's this crazy corn gleaning tool that uh, al allows me. I, I scrape an ear of corn across this tool, and it gleans only the pulp and the juice from the kernels. And you then just simmer that down in a pan to, to the consistency of like mashed potatoes. Add just a little bit of butter and fresh chive, and you can serve it for dessert. It it gets cleaned up immediately. 
<laughs> well, a lot of people, as I said, know you best as Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec. He was a big libertarian working in local government. But for some people, including a number of our listeners today, the line between Ron and Nick is a bit blurry. Uh, One of you texted this, why is Nick a conservative and what does that mean in a country on the verge of a new civil war, particularly as a middle-aged white man? What do you want people to know about the line between Nick Offerman and Ron Swanson, the character? Uh, It's a a great question. Um, I I would... Ask you know the viewers um, to uh, to soften their their focus. I think um, it's funny. First of all, people's just interpretation of Ron Swanson that uh, they come out of watching the show. I think with their own preconceived notions because I don't think Ron is a conservative. Ron Ron is a true libertarian, so he's not misogynistic or homophobic. Um, he he is a, a fan of everybody uh, as long as they're not trying to tax him or as long as they're not involved in government. Um, and, and I think that a lot of Ron's sensibilities uh, were born of my own. Um, but, but, you know, everybody's different. Uh, and, and um, in our, in our current political climate, especially, I would ask people, <clears throat> to examine me and Ron with a great deal more nuance. Uh, I can be um, a great lover of, of nature and animals, but can also respect hunting um, and the use of firearms for sustenance hunting while I revile trophy hunting or the, the strange uh, sensibility some uh, white men feel to carry a a rifle around town to somehow protect our hot sauce rack at the Chipotle from tyranny, uh, I guess. So, I mean, all, all these conversations require uh, a sense of nuance and I, I I don't look to uh, any political charts. I just look to the decency and values my parents taught me, which, uh, which are much more human and, and I think truly libertarian, um, than what people have come to understand that term to mean. One of our text club listeners wrote, Nick, thank you for being an advocate for libertarianism in your role as Ron Swanson. You indirectly helped many people understand inefficiencies in the government. Did you see that as part of your role in playing Ron, that you were an advocate for libertarianism? No, I mean, that's one of the funny things is is uh, a lot of people... Uh, see the the messaging, um, I guess, uh, of of Ron's character uh, in a comedy. You know, the messaging that's used to make people laugh, uh, or as a counterpoint to the ebullient, uh, incredibly passionate government work of Leslie Nope, uh, Amy Poehler's character. People see these things somehow as an endorsement of of anything, rather than. Uh, the means to an end to serve a comedy narrative on a show. Um, that said, uh, and I, I would also say I, I don't have a big enough brain to wrap my head around. Is it. one of the reasons I don't, I don't think I could ever go into politics. Is I, I I can't wrap my head around all of the conversations. Um, I, I'm reasonably smart and pretty good at reading books, but. If you get me up in a debate, I'm going to eventually shrug and say, let's get a sandwich and a beer and uh, just just do our best here. Um, And so, you know, that's one of the funny things is that people somehow can take the character I played, which is written by very smart, funny, liberal writers, uh, and take it as some sort of political endorsement of any stripe. Um, I think the shows of Mike Schur, which also include Brooklyn Nine-Nine and The Good Place especially, um, are an endorsement of, of ethical behavior. You know, they're an exploration of, of how we humans can get along no matter who we voted for. That, that's what we're after much more than supporting uh, one side or another. Well, we got this question from Scott in Pittsburgh. I'm sure Nick gets tired of all the questions about masculinity based just on the fact that he played a masculine character, but I have to know what his thoughts really are about men and crying. 
Ron Swanson's rule was you only cry at funerals and the Grand Canyon. In my experience as a 40-year-old American male, we're not even allowed to cry at funerals. I once fought crying at a funeral so hard that it gave me a migraine. Scott, thanks for that message. What would you say to Scott? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, and, and it's heartbreaking to hear that. Uh, I, uh, I definitely exist in such a bubble and circle of, of art, artists and create creatives um, that it's astonishing when I hear that that kind of toxic masculinity still exists uh, in this modern world. <clears throat> um, but I would absolutely say, break that down. Let's, let's break down these these dumb, old-fashioned, gendered ideas of when you can cry or not, or hug each other. I mean, you know, I, I thought I, I thought we had gotten this across, but I guess uh, we're, we're still we're still at it. But let me just say loud and clear: it, to my sen- sensibility, it's much more manly, and I don't even like this term of manly uh, or masculinity. I think it it shows much greater character, no matter what gender uh, you sign up for. uh, It shows much greater character to simply stand up for your beliefs, to stand up with integrity for the things you believe in and those around you. Um, I run my wood shop. The wood shop employs all women and one gender nonconforming person. And and part of the reason for that is because uh, that's, that's a place where People say, oh, you build furniture. That's for dads in the garage. And I say, no, using tools to make wood into tables is something everyone loves. Knitting, sewing a button on my shirt is something everyone loves. Baking cupcakes. There's no reason to assign gender to all these things. And that's just an old-fashioned, calcified stereotype that I think will really help advance us as a civilization if we can break that down. So please cry away, Scott, and uh, you can tell them Ron Swanson said so. We're discussing nature, woodworking, and walking with Nick Offerman. A reminder to have your questions answered on future topics or just to let us know what you think, tweet us at 1A. This message comes from NPR sponsor Griffles. Senior Director of Corporate Affairs Vlasta Hakes explains the science behind the plasma-derived medicines the company produces. Plasma contains proteins and antibodies. There are people who are missing those antibodies or they're missing a protein that helps their body function. And what Griffles then does is we collect this plasma and then isolate those proteins and antibodies to produce a medicine. To learn more about donating plasma and to find a Griffles Center near you, visit grifflesplasma.com. On this season of the StoryCorps podcast from NPR, stories about people who defied the odds. How was a, a colored boy from South Carolina going to become an astronaut? But Ron was the one who didn't accept societal norms as being his norm. Our new season drops December 7th. Listen on the NPR One app at npr.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Over this last year and a half, the world's been through a lot. So on this season of the StoryCorps podcast, we'll hear stories reminding us that even when times are hard, we can still begin again. Listen to our new season wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's get back to our conversation with actor Nick Offerman. Here's what David from St. Paul shared with us. I retired from medicine in 2014. I worked nights and I got sleep disordered and just couldn't do it anymore. I started making guitars and ukuleles as a self-taught woodworker. Then Paddle Your Own Canoe came out, and I really found kinship in Nick Offerman's philosophy. And then Good Clean Fun came out a couple of years later, and I started making a couple canoe paddles. I made tabletop looms, cribbage boards, things for other people. And it really, uh, it really became uh, my current lifestyle. And and I just want to offer him my thanks uh, for understanding in somehow what other people need uh, and putting it out there so we have some support. 
David, thanks for sharing that with us. I have to say, Nick, our text club has a lot of questions for you about woodworking. One person wrote, I've been interested in woodworking for some time. My grandfather and uncle were carpenters. So first, where do I start? And second, how do I keep from cutting off my fingers? This is a serious question. I am not particularly comfortable with kitchen knives. And another text club member asks, if someone has an interest in woodworking and is on a fixed income, what are the most necessary tools someone should buy just getting started out? So let's start with that first question about getting comfortable with the process itself. Well, thank you. That was a a lovely sentiment from uh, David. I appreciate it. Um, And, you know, uh, most most of the advice that I dispense, if it can be called advice, um, is aimed at myself more than anybody else. It, when I when I spend my time writing a book or touring and talking about woodworking or making things with my hands in general, that's time that I'm not sitting on my couch watching TV or playing video games or somehow overly diverting myself. It's also time that I'm not sitting in the pub drinking uh, two or three too many pints. Um, so it's you know I'm on I'm on this team as well. Uh, of self betterment through hand crafting. Um, to answer that specific question, we live in a golden age of, of learning to do anything you care to do, um, through the incredible wealth of books. I mean, I'm a self-taught woodworker through the books of lost art press, the fine woodworking magazine, uh, Taunton press in the Northeast. Um, but also, in the age of YouTube, I mean, I'm fully confident that if I wanted to forge myself a suit of armor to ride into battle, I could find uh, countless videos on YouTube of how to do so. Um, So there's a lot of incredible instruction to be had these days on YouTube. Um, And and as far as getting comfortable, um, that's a great question. I mean, whenever we introduce anybody to the wood shop, uh, it's full of very sharp steel, whether it's hand tools, chisels, um, all the way up to big machines, table saws and band saws. There's a lot of ways you can hurt yourself. And so first, and we always say safety first, protect your eyes, protect your ears, protect your lungs from the dust, um, and then respect uh, the sharp steel. Understand before you dive into any technique how to do it safely without chopping off a finger or, or what have you. Um, and, and I can even, I can roll into the, the last question too, which is, uh, getting into woodworking. The thing I always ask people is what do you want to make? I mean, if you want to carve wooden spoons, that's a pretty affordable way to get in. Um, and all you need to be able to do is cut out the blank of a, the shape of a spoon. And then you're using mostly hand carving tools, uh, Turning small items like turning pens or small bowls is another affordable way to get into it. But by and large, uh, if you just start with sort of woodworking 101, you're going to get into hand tools, uh, learning how to to square and and true the edges of a piece of wood, learning how to join two pieces of wood together. So you're using chisels and mallets and hand planes and hand saws. these things are, are affordable, but I, I would also say that you get what you pay for. Um, I, I would much rather spend the money on a, a good dovetail saw than eventually the five saws that I'll throw out the window because they're made of uh, inferior steel. Now, you mentioned spoons, but another text club member wants to know what woodworking projects would you recommend for a novice, something that's not too complicated for a beginner? So maybe once you've moved past the spoon level, is there something else you'd recommend? Well, a popular item is, is a cutting board. Um, you can make a cutting board out of, out of one piece of plank, or you can... Uh, one great thing about cutting boards is they can be made by gluing up scraps, so you can often get somebody's free scrap box <clears throat> and glue them into a, a plank shape. And the thing about a, a cutting board or making wooden coasters for beverages um, is it's a great introduction to just learning to smooth and finish and usually oil a piece of wood. Um, 
and you really get into what woodworking is all about, which is uh, working in concert with this incredible organic material. It has personality. You know, you have to learn to get along with it. It expands and contracts with the relative humidity. And so when you're learning to join it together, that's why you see tabletops split open because woodworkers have, have made those tables without respecting those properties of wood. And so that combined with the grain <clears throat> and the color, uh, that's what that's the spell that wood casts on us woodworkers. When you just sand a, a cutting board and then oil it and see the grain and color pop out, um, then you quickly understand what it's all about. And those are delights that can be had very affordably. Well, a lot of people want to know what your favorite type of wood is to work with. Do you have a favorite or, or a few favorites that you really like to return to because of how they, they speak to you? Uh, it always depends on the application. Um, if I had to pick one wood, I would probably pick American white oak, uh, Quercus alba is its uh, Latin name, just because it's it's the most... Uh, it's it's the most resilient. It's it's the mo most incredible jack of all trades of our domestic hardwoods, but it depends what you're making. If if I'm building a canoe or a guitar, then I want something much more lightweight, usually a cedar or a spruce. Um, if I'm building you a, a dining table, then the cabinet woods come into play: mahogany, maple, cherry. Um, uh, American black walnut, and in California we have a a native species called um, California Claro walnut, which is just gorgeous. Uh, so all, I mean, it, it depends on on what we're making and uh, what color your rug is. <laughs> Another text club listener asks, "How did Nick go from being a woodsman to an actor?" I think he <laughs> means a wood a woodworker, not an actual <laughs> woodsman, or maybe he means woodsman. I don't know. They both fit. Well. Um, all of these, uh, all of these hats, um, I sort of grew up, I guess, wearing, uh, wearing them simultaneously. You know, I, uh, I grew up in a family that's very self-sufficient. Uh, my mom's side of the family are all still farming and that means they all are mechanics and carpenters and, uh, and tailors and chefs, um, and, and, and botanists. Uh, so, so a lot of that rubbed off on me. I went to theater school. I wanted to become an artist. So while I was pursuing a career in that, I was able to use my tool skills from my youth to learn to build scenery. And eventually I began building like decks and cabins, which involved post and beam joinery, uh, timber framing, uh, it's known as, and, and timber framing, uh, when you shrink it down is how you make uh, heirloom furniture. It's, it's, it's joining pieces of wood together without screws or fasteners, uh, so that they, they last for centuries. Um, so they're all, they're all, uh, avenues of study that I'm still pursuing. I hope to become a better woodworker and woodsman, uh, and actor. Here's an email we got from Sally who says, I completely agree that we need to look at our own backyards and neighborhoods for an awe-inspiring nature experience. We can each do our part to help our local environment and natural habitat that is always waiting to sprout up. And another Text Club listener sent us this, Many national parks and state parks were flooded with visitors before and since the pandemic started. At the same time, more and more people feel isolated and depressed. From Mr. Offerman's experience spending time in nature, does he have any suggestions for how how to balance getting more people out in nature without overburdening these often sensitive landscapes. What are your thoughts? How do you hope we think about exploring our natural lands? Well, I mean, you know, that, that sounds like a, a problem for greater organizational minds than my own. But, but in general, I would say leaning into the Aldo Leopold side of my book versus the John Muir is to... Uh, to look away from the headlines, uh, from the big national parks, you know, there, there are many places to amuse your family besides a Disney park. And there are many incredible, uh, park lands besides, you know, besides Yosemite, um, on my travels that I, that I, uh, detail in my book, my wife and I hit a bunch of great state parks, uh, across the American Southwest 
and I mean, even growing up in rural Illinois, there were uh, several small parks just in my in my farming neighborhood where you had a place to have a picnic with your family or loved ones, beautiful stretches of woods with, with a creek or river running through them. And all of these places can just absolutely capture your fascination. Uh, I love to go there with people. And for me, I'm always drawn to running water. I like to find the frogs and the toads. I like to get out and see what kind of birds' nests I can find. I love to look for the raptors. Uh, I freak out if I can find an owl. And I'll I'll just sit and watch a a bird or a squirrel or a chipmunk all day. Um, So it depends what you're into, but but these opportunities are everywhere. And that's, you know, if everyone just goes to the big ticket items, then then you're going to be sitting in traffic in Yellowstone because somebody saw one buffalo. Whereas uh, within, within several miles of that, uh, of that park itself are incredible landscapes to get out and walk in that don't require a ticket. What's the next level of exploration for you? In reading the book, you, it's clear how much you love being out in these spaces and enjoy some of the physicality you can experience while you're there. You, you were working with sheep and building fences and all kinds of things. But what's the next, the next place, the next frontier, if you will? Well, uh, I, I'm really besotted with the British Isles myself. Uh, between, between there and uh, the incredible spectrum of topography that we have here in North America... Um, it's really wherever I end up. I mean, I just, I just shot a TV show up in Calgary, um, for a month and that's next to Banff and Lake Louise. So uh, wherever I am, I just kind of look around and see what there is. Uh, sometimes it doesn't involve mountains. Sometimes it does, but I just, I'm fascinated with the charisma of people, um, So wherever I go and and my career just takes me all over the place, whether I'm touring or or filming on location. So when I get there, I say, hey, what do you guys like to go look at outside? And I'm never disappointed. You know, it it might be more swampy. It might be some Everglades or something in the Florida Keys. It might be something that requires uh, a winter parka in the mountains of Canada or anything in between. Um, I can easily be fascinated, but the key is finding somebody who uh, who knows the area because they immediately key you in to so many things that I would never notice on my own. That's actor Nick Offerman. He's also a woodworker, and his newest book is called Where the Deer and the Antelope Play, The Pastoral Observations of One Ignorant American Who Loves to Walk Outside. Nick, the book is just lovely. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for having me. I sure appreciate it. Today's producer was Amanda Williams. Barb Anguiano produces our podcast. This program comes to you from WAMU, part of American University in Washington, distributed by NPR. I'm Jen White. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Paycom. When it comes to payroll, pretty good is never good enough. There's a better way to do payroll, and it's the way it always should have been. Letting HR do less by letting employees have access to more. Betty, Paycom's award-winning, industry-first, employee-driven payroll experience, allows your workers to do their own payroll so HR can focus on more strategic initiatives. Learn more at paycom.com slash B-E-T-I. This message is brought to you by the NPR Coffee Club. A subscription brings fresh roasted coffee directly to your door, and you can also give a gift subscription to the NPR superfan in your life. Learn more about our new NPR blends by visiting us at nprcoffeeclub.org.